So your bell work for part two is research. You were supposed to research Windley Key. So you're supposed to look it up on your laptop or your phone, okay? And find the location and what key is north and south. If you're not from around here, key is what they call the islands at the tip of Florida, the keys, okay? Um, so what did you come up with? So this is Mrs. Key and I last year at Windley Key Fossil Reef Geological State Park. And I've been to the Keys many times. Mrs. Keene's grandparents had a house in the Keys. Um, so we've been there quite a few times. My cousin actually has a house in Key West. Um, this place is, you, you wouldn't think this place even existed down in the Keys, but it does. It's on the main, main road and um, on Windley Key. And you, there are these paths that go through a quarry. If you know what a quarry is, it's where they cut stone out. So for many years, they used this quarry to cut ancient coral stone that used to be above the sea level, used to be higher, obviously. You know, like a lot higher, like 50 feet or whatever, higher than what it is, maybe 30 feet, whatever. But Florida used to be covered with water, totally, virtually almost all covered. And it's had a few periods of being covered for millions of years and then uncovered and then covered over time through different patterns of the world's evolution. And so all of this coral formed at one of those higher level, warmer times of the world. But they use this for building. So, and you can walk around on here, there's trails. Um, I was jumping on these rocks. And um, even the ground is just all coral. So all this was all at this height at one time. And they had these big machines there that they show you now. They don't use them anymore. Um, and they cut blocks of coral to use for building structures and walls and railroads. And so here's a, up close, they've got little, you can take a little tour. There's a, it's a state uh, park, so you can um, have, a, you know, there's a ranger there and everything, and they've got little brochures. And you can, if you look really close, you can see the actual coral heads and where they once grew. And there's now trees growing down. It's just a really, really cool place. We discovered it. It was, it was like a half an hour before it was closing, so we had to like rush through it, but it was pretty, pretty cool. I was, I was impressed with it. All right, so um, the Florida, long story short, Florida is built on coral reef. Everywhere you dig down, if you drive down the roads around here and you see the canals cut out, if you look at some of the canals, partic particularly the ones further in and south, um, Fort Lauderdale area, you will see at the water line, depending upon how much rain we've had, rock along the water line. And that's the coral reef level. And the, above that's dirt from trees having been growing here for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so we're gonna talk about the different, uh, the rest of these different um, areas. So we're gonna talk about the uh, rocky shore, sandy shore, and um, mangrove forest. But we've talked about these before, so mangrove forest, we're not gonna go too deep in because we kind of covered that. So if you look at this picture, you're gonna see that there's different organisms that live in different levels. The splash zone, the high tide zone, the mid tide zone, the low tide zone. And the whole thing is called the intertidal zone. It's also called the littoral zone, right? <clears throat> and so depending upon where you are, see these organisms can't live outside of the water, not for very long at all, okay? But these can. So these pretty much live, just get splashed and they're fine. Um, but they could also live underwater. So let's take a look. And we have all of these shores here in Florida. That's the amazing thing about this, guys. 
it's very rare that you can say, pick a state in the United States of America and say that all of these habitats are in one state. Go north to Georgia. There's no mangroves. So, eh, Georgia's out. So anywhere north, okay? But what about California? California has rocky shores and sandy shores and uh, no coral reefs, okay, no mangroves. Florida is the only one that has all of these, which is why you should feel lucky, blessed, that you have, you can, you can in one day, visit all four of these habitats. In one day, less than a day, in a couple of hours. So cool. All right, so each zone has some information about it that we have to get down. So, um, again, typically exposed rocky shore, changing abiotic. Remember, abiotic is non-living factors across these zones during one tidal cycle. So the splash zone. Okay, you've you've all I think you've, if you've been to the beach, you've been in this. You've been in the splash zone, um, and there's no rocky shores in Boca, sorry, but you just have to go a little bit north to Jupiter and there's plenty of rocky shores. It's pretty amazing. It's called Blowing Rock. I suggest you go there. <clears throat> or extra credit, if you can show me pictures between now and spring break. Deal? Okay. All right, so, um, so for quarter three, you can get extra credit by showing me that you've been to a rocky shore in Florida, which is only an hour north of here. Okay, so take a weekend, take a Saturday, go convince your family, your friends to go and check out Blowing Rocks Park, okay? Exposed to air, only receives seawater, crashed on shore, pretty self-explanatory. They're very adapted to preventing desiccation. Desiccation means drying out. And you have the upper shore. So they're pretty much in air for most of the day, but at the high tide, they're covered. Um, only submerged during the high tide. A lot of waves, a lot of wave activity, okay? Um, they also have adaptations to prevent desiccation um, and temperature changes. But they have to watch out for terrestrial predators here. Same here at the splash zone. What's a terrestrial predator? Like a raccoon or a seagull, right? Middle shore, so the organism is best adapted to constant change because half of the day they're in the water and half of the day they're out of the water. Um, and they receive the most wave energy throughout the entire day for the longest period, right? And of course the lower shore again is only um, during the lowest low tides are they ever exposed. And you're gonna have more soft-bodied organisms, less shells, more algae. These are limpets. They, you can find them, and there's a, a snail mixed in there. Um, you can find them at Blowing Rocks in Jupiter. Okay, so biotic, remember, is living. Abiotic is non-living, okay? And so, um, the distribution and abundance of organisms are going to be affected by other things that live with them as well as those abiotic factors. <clears throat> so temperature fluctuations. Obviously, some things can take more temperature than others. Light intensity changes. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory, but there isn't too much light intensity change in a rocky shore because it's always in that light zone, epipelagic, um, or pelagic, you know. Salinity changes, yes, that's gonna be huge. Number one, they're on the shore, <coughs> excuse me, the shoreline. <coughs> Good timing. So, fresh water is gonna be constantly running in from streams, rivers, rivulets, runoff. But of course, when the salt water goes down, where's the salt? It's gone, right? So they have no salt, so salinity changes. In a rock pool, okay, so um, I don't have, well, this is essentially a, a rock pool. This is a tidal pool 
left behind when the tide goes out, all right? You're gonna get an oxygen level decrease for two reasons. One, the organisms that are stuck in that rock pool are using the oxygen, right? And two, as the sun beats down on this pool, and see there's mixing out here, there's not too much mixing going on here, it heats up the water. And remember in the very first unit, we know that higher temperatures make gases leave. Solid solutes increase their ability to dissolve in warm water, but not gases, it's the opposite, remember? So oxygen will be leaving as that water temperature goes up, when the sun's beating down on it, evaporating that water. So that's a huge adaptation that these organisms have to have. Of course, large waves. Um, most organisms are found in the lower, uh, lower in the rocks. Few of them can survive the splash zone. And then, of course, other things like food availability and predation. So here you've got sea stars preying on mollusks. Here you've got a crab munching on some algae or something living in the algae. Another stone crab there. <clears throat> Periwinkles and um, brown algae called rack. And these are limpets and periwinkle snails. And they're pretty much closed up right now because they're outside of the water. The tide has gone down, and so they're just using the water they have in their, stored up in their shell for oxygen and life processes. Okay, so now we're talking about named examples. So <clears throat> here we've got periwinkles and limpets. Those are the two organisms that we're discussing right now. And those are the two organisms that Cambridge needs you, they don't need you, they want you to know about, you need to know about it. So that if you're asked a question about the splash zone and adaptations and biotic factors and abiotic factors, you can make reference to periwinkles, which are snails, those are periwinkles. What helps me is to draw a snail real quick and write periwinkle next to it, and then it locks it in my brain, right? And this is a limpet. There are all the different kinds of species of them, um, but periwinkles are just snails. You've all seen snails. You know what a snail is. Think Gary, SpongeBob's pet, okay? Limpets don't have, have, a, have a similar type of thing, but they're kind of like this, and they go, and they suction cup onto a rock, okay? And they make a seal around their shell on the rock. And that's pretty much where they spend their time. They will, when the water comes up, they'll move and they have this, um, just like the snails do, they have this radula that scrapes algae off the rock, okay? And they have a muscular foot because they are mollusks, okay? Now we're in the upper shore. So again, this is submerged during high tide, low periods, uh, long periods of time. So now you've got chitons um, and channeled rack. That's what we're looking at here, okay? We already said limpets in the last one, but chitons are very similar to limpets, except chitons, these are chitons. You, you could find these in Jupiter on the rocks. These are also called polyplacophora. Poly means many. Plaques, these are the plaques, like shells. And they are essentially a limpet that can bend like that and even attach to even more uneven surfaces than a limpet can. So a chitin, and this is rack, channeled rack. It's a brown seaweed that has nematophores, the gas uh, balloons to help it stay afloat. So it can photosynthesize, right? Um, so uh, they grip tightly to the rock and they make that seal around the outside. And then um, the rack can curl up its fronds when the tide goes out to prevent from drying out, to prevent desiccation. 
because water is constantly evaporating from their surface. Now we're in the middle shore, and so here we're talking about specific referenced organisms, barnacles and mussels, okay? So these are the two um, exact organisms that we're talking about here. Named examples. So barnacles, um, they come out of their shell when immersed, and they use their feet, essentially, to just go like this and capture organisms in the water and bring them into their mouth, okay? Um, and then when the tide goes out, they close their shells up. They go, put it, they close them and capture the water that's in there, and they feed up, they use that to survive till the tide comes in again. Kind of scary, actually. Imagine, imagine we have, were like that. Imagine, you know, during part of the day, we were able to go out, you know, and the doors and the windows open. And another part of the day, sealed up, tight, everything closed, locked in, you can't go outside. It's kind of sort of what we, do, what we do anyway, right? At nighttime, we lock all our doors and turn the alarm on and close the blinds so nobody can see inside. <clears throat> and then mussels, they have those very strong spider web-like, but they're not the same, bissel threads that they attach themselves to rocks. These are mussels here, these are all mussels here. You may be wondering how do they stay as a mussel, like, which is like a clam, right? How does it stay up on that rock? It's got these strong threads called bissel threads that attach. And so then they have two clothes, bivalve, two, two valves, two shells to close um, to capture water and survive when the tide goes out. And now at the lower shore, you've got the rock pools, um, <clears throat> you've got seaweed, algae, sea stars, sea urchins, sea anemones, oysters and clams, all those things. These are just giant sea anemones. This is them when they're closed up and out of the water. This is the Pacific Northwest, uh, like Oregon or the state of Washington. Um, and this is them when they're in the water with their tentacles out. So they have the ability to pull in their tentacles and kind of close up so that they don't dry out, okay? And that's all seaweed all around those rocks. And now we have tide and rock pools. So this is an area uh, where organisms can remain feeding and functioning and respiring, okay, um, even during low tide. And you could find these at the beach in Jupiter as well. Here's some more pictures of a of tidal pools. Okay, this is called a um, a keyhole limpet because it's got this looks like a keyhole. Um, this is a form of brown algae, kind of kelp, more mussels, seaweed. <clears throat> if you look carefully, you can probably find some more organisms here. These are closed up anemones, sea star, looking, hunting for food outside of the water. You can easily go back in the water if it wanted to, but it's looking, looking for a snack. All right, now we're at the sandy shore. Again, five miles from here, you're at the sandy shore, okay? So, unstable, shifting substrate. The substrate is what the bottom is, right? Substrate, so and it's porous. You see the wave come in and the wave go out and you get the water just goes right through the sand. Pores, full of pores. So there are biotic and abiotic factors that affect a sandy shore as well. And sandy shores have a relatively low biodiversity compared to rocky shores and mangroves. <clears throat> because of, it's just sand. Nothing can really grow in the sand, like plants, or nothing can hold on to, to create an, uh, um, a more stable environment because it's constantly shifting, right? So most of the organisms, organisms that live here are going to be burrowing animals 
in fauna, remember. Fauna means animal. In means, well, in. So these are animals that live in the sand. <clears throat> Salinity changing. Same reason for the rocky shore. Light intensity changing due to depth. Same, same thing. Constant movements. Constant wave water height changes and currents. And you also have your terrestrial and marine predators here. And there's not many species that have adapted as well as well to this environment as others have. You're going to have worms. You're going to have um, some bivalve mollusks. Another worm there. And these uh, mole crabs. They also call them um, uh, sand fleas, but they're not sand fleas. We've had this discussion before. They're mole crabs, and they, they just burrow into the sand whenever the tide, whenever the wave washes in. Okay, so particle size. This is very easily explained, okay? <clears throat> so if I had a jar of dirt and I poured water into it, would the water immediately go down to the bottom or would it take a while for it to filter through slowly and then eventually the water would get to the bottom after a couple minutes? And that's what would happen, okay? Now let's say I put sand, just plain sand in a jar, and I poured water into the, into the sand. How long would it take for the water to get to the very bottom? It would be like a few seconds, right? Pour the water in, it would go, and it would go right to the bottom. Faster than the dirt, right? Now what if I had just pebbles in a jar, and I poured water in? Where would the water go instantly? Pretty much you wouldn't be able to count how many seconds. It would be like less than a second, right at the bottom, right? So that simply states that the bigger the particle, the more porous. That's what this is all about, okay? Particle size on permeability. The bigger the particle, the more water can go fat through it and faster. Done. Okay, that's the whole concept. <clears throat> All right, so adaptations organisms have to live on a sandy shore. They have to be able to burrow. They have to be able to feed on detritus, that stuff that's essentially dirt. But in this case, sand is really a mixture of broken up rocks and shells with dirt in it. And then filter feeding when the tide is in is uh, extremely important. As moon snails, they feed on detritus, worms, filter feeders, crabs, they will, it's called a bubbler crab, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, they will just take a ball of sand and roll it around by their mouth and get all the good stuff out and then put the ball on to the side, the empty, no more food in the ball over there. Make a new ball, roll it around in their mouth or outside of their mouth, eat all the stuff that's in there, put the ball down. That's how they're, they're um, detritus feeders. Here's a mole crab. This is what a mole crab looks like when it is in, when it's feeding, okay? So they'll burrow underneath the water, but when, they're, uh, when the wave comes in, but when they're under the water, they stick their little antennae out like this, and they'll just filter the water for food and eat, that's how they eat. They're cute little guys. They can't hurt you. Put them in your hand, they, they don't hurt. <clears throat> Here are um, some clams, some bivalve mollusks. Bivalve, again, means two valves, two shells. And so we learned about these guys um, and how they use their muscular foot to dig into the substrate. And then they use their in-current and ex-current siphons to filter food from the water and that's and, and they can move around if they want to sometimes they get washed up sometimes a strong wave comes in these are razor clams you'll find these um, washed up on the shore sometimes not in this abundance here in florida but they're just like a regular clam they're just elongated and they're called razor clams because they look like um one of those old-fashioned straight edge razors that you open up and you shave with okay that's what they look like and believe it or not they're very sharp. The shells are extremely sharp. I actually have a scar 
on my hand right here from a razor clam. Can you see this scar right there? It goes from here all the way up to there. Yeah, that was from a razor clam when I was a teenager. <clears throat> I was digging mussels for bait um, on the south shore of Long Island in New York and I put my hand in the mud and just cut me right, right open there. Very sharp. Sand bubbler crabs. You have to know about these guys. Um, like I said before, they make these amazing patterns when they feed. It's almost like artwork. Nature is full of art, right? So they, like I said, they take a, a little ball and they just roll it around, get the stuff out and then drop the ball. And they have these little places that they, little burrows that they burrow down in to get more water because the burrow goes down to water depth and they get their gills wet again with water because they need to wet their gills to breathe. <clears throat> and they come back up again and they feed on the detritus and they go back down and they do it in a, a pattern. It's pretty amazing. And then finally, the mangrove forest. We're almost done with this uh, part of the notes here. We've covered these in depth already. <clears throat> so we know that they're salt tolerant trees. They are pretty much the only, one of the very few species of terrestrial plant that is adapted to a saltwater environment, right? So, um, and of course, they form some major tropical and subtropical forests along coasts, which Palm Beach County has essentially decimated uh, because we all had to live in our beautiful homes and condominiums uh, on the intracoastal. So hopefully a giant storm won't come and wash away everyone's dreams <clears throat> because they were too blind to see that they needed to protect. This is what it used to look like. This is what the intracoastal used to look like until humans came along and ripped them mostly out. That's why there are no white mangroves here. There's only black and red, right? The only county in the state of Florida well, along the coastline doesn't have that species of mangrove growing in it. And you can, uh, but some places you can go um, and do canoe trips through these mangrove forests and it's really pretty cool. And remember they're nurseries, they're high biodiversity. So you can have all sorts of critters here, mud skippers. I don't know if we have these in Florida, but pelicans and many different species of birds. Um, lizards of all kinds, either invasive like that one or our own crocodiles and alligators. Spotted couscous, we don't have those here, but it would be pretty cool if we did. Um, different kinds of snail species and crab species and sharks and fish. Shark is a fish um, living in the, in the mangroves. So <clears throat> highly productive, high productivity. And of course, we have the different kinds, the different species of mangroves, depending upon their uh, distance from the shore. So, and remember what these roots are called? They're called the metaphors, so that the, the, they can get oxygen when the tide comes in. And propagule roots. And then you can see down below how just a whole an ecosystem down here. So conditions required, they need a sandy or muddy substrate. They need, um, the water needs to be shallow or shallow enough for the propagules to take root. A mixture of salt and a fresh water, so an estuary type environment. Needs to be tropical or subtropical, they can't grow up north. An intertidal, where deposition is greater than erosion. So that, there, that means you have to have a reduced wave action. So it's often on the coast where coral reefs exist offshore, because the coral reef out here is going to break up the incoming waves, protecting the shore from erosion, and so that these roots can take root, these plants can take root, 
and start to spread, just like this. These were actually probably planted in this regular fashion um, to replenish some that was taken away. And you can replenish mangrove forests. You can replant them. There's actually programs here in Florida that you can volunteer for um, and go out and plant mangroves. So the red mangrove, this is specifically Cambridge question. So they're asking you how the red mangrove tree is adapted to the, to the environment where mangroves live. And they salter filth out through the roots of the red mangroves and glands on leaves okay, of, of black mangroves. So red mangroves, they, they, salt, they filter the salt out through the roots. And um, black mangroves excrete the salt through glands in the leaves. So you can actually go up to a leaf, and it looks like it has a white powder on it. If you look at it up close, it's actually crystals. And you could lick it off. I probably would give it a little white first or something, but just lick it, and it will taste like pure salt, like you sprinkle on your french fries. Pretty cool. Ecological importance of mangrove forests. Two more slides and we are done. Um, <clears throat> they hold sediment in place, of course, so, so that helps build islands, helps build land. Um, the more mangroves you know, that start spreading out, the more um, substrate can be held. And so leaves build up and then eventually you'll get an island forming there. We know that they're huge nursery grounds for biodiversity. They absorb wave energy on the coastlines. They um, provide habitats for all sorts of animals. They clean the water. They provide shade, keeping the water cool. And they are a carbon sink. They pull, when they're growing, they pull in carbon from the atmosphere via carbon dioxide and store it in their tissues. Here you've got some, this is underwater. Here you've got some tunicates. These are those um, invertebrate chordates that we learned about in unit four. They have a notochord and a, and a, um, a you know, spinal cord, but no spine, no bones. So they're sort of related to us, but not really, okay? Importance for humans, we get food um, and as well as firewood. People harvest mangrove for firewood. Um, medicine holds sediment in place, reduces erosion, protecting our shorelines and our investments, right? And then um, absorbing uh, wave energy. So when you remove them, you're pretty much hurting yourself. Okay, and the last slide. Threats to mangrove forests. So, torn down in, in third world countries to build these nasty shrimp farms that are an ecological disaster. We'll talk more about those in a future unit when we talk about um, um, sustainable fishing industry. Timber and lumber, like I said, that's actual wood from mangrove trees that's been harvested. Building, uh, building Palm Beach, pretty much, okay, coastal development. Increasing temperatures, large waves like tsunamis and hurricanes, and trash and oil spills, pollution. So all of these things will threaten the mangrove environment. Okay, and that's part two of our Unit 5 notes.